In this and in the next section, we'll look in more detail at the areas of cortex associated with volitional control of attention and planning. Here again is the image of seven cortical circuits defined by co-varying cortical activity. Each color corresponds to areas of cortex whose activity is highly correlated with areas that have the same color. In the last section, I argued that the yellow and green areas are especially central to volitional control. Now let's unpack what may be going on with regard to cognition in a bit more detail here. Many brain scientists assume that frontal areas, circled here, are involved in regulating, controlling, or governing the rest of the brain. They do this by carrying out operations in a mental workspace of sorts, sometimes called working memory. But where do these frontal brain areas get the operands over which mental operations will take place? Well, one path appears to be from the ventral stream, circled here, which passes attended information up to the frontal lobes so that they have information about the perceived world so plans can be made concerning how to respond to the goings-on in the world. But another source of information appears to be from the dorsal stream, circled here. Some scientists believe that these posterior parietal regions realize something like a salience map. But what is salience? It's an evaluation of the importance of a stimulus. Before we shift our eyes or attention to the next thing, it stands to reason that there has been an evaluation of what might be the most useful or valuable location to shift our eyes or attention to. So, one possibility is that these posterior parietal areas realize a saliency map, which in turn feeds the most salient operands into frontal areas for the execution of mental operations, such as making decisions about what to do next, given this ventral and dorsal information. How the brain defines salience or importance is an open issue in neuroscience. Somewhere in the brain, Probably here in the posterior parietal lobe, there has to be a comparison of many different kinds of inputs. At any given moment, the visual system might say that this moving thing is salient. The amygdala might say that this potentially dangerous thing is most salient. The reward system might say this other rewarding thing is very salient. And volitional processes might say that the task at hand is the most salient thing. How are these conflicting salience signals reconciled? Is there a winner-take-all decision? Is there something like a weighted sum among all these inputs to the master saliency map, if there even is such a master map? These are all open questions in neuroscience. Time and research will hopefully yield answers to these important questions about brain function. Once salience has been defined, attention can be allocated to the most salient thing. One group of scientists who wrote the article shown here have argued that the dorsal attentional network should really be broken down into two subnetworks, one involved in considering and selecting and switching between tasks, and the other associated with maintaining or sticking to a given task. This frontal parietal circuit, which we will talk more about in a couple of sections when we talk about the neural basis of volitional imagination, may be involved in selecting and switching among tasks appropriately. And this neural circuit linking the opercular part of the frontal lobe with the medial frontal cortex may be involved in maintaining a task. I believe this is correct. We need both the volitional capacity to choose a path of action, and we need the volitional capacity to persevere in pursuing it. The latter might be associated with the old-fashioned idea of willpower. It's often the case that activities that require staying on task activate some part of the cingulate cortex shown here. And in particular, if there's a mistake where someone momentarily fails to stay on task, anterior cingulate cortex tends to become more active. One way to think about this would be to say that the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in error detection. I think that that's not incorrect, but it misses the main point. The error detection is in the service of staying on task. It is in the service of willpower, so to speak. A famous example in this regard is the so-called Stroop task. The task here is to say out loud the color of a word without reading it. When there is no conflict between the color of the ink and the written word, this is easy. But watch what happens when you try to name the colors in this list as fast as you can without reading the words. Stop the video now and try to name all the colors of these words until the end of the list and restart the video when you reach the end of the list. Well, that was difficult, wasn't it? 
If you are like most people, you will at some point have started to unintentionally read the words. When people make these kinds of mistakes in the MRI scanner, their dorsal anterior cingulate shows a rapid increase in activity. But the point of detecting an error is not just to detect it, but to correct oneself and return to the task at hand, which in this case is naming the ink color. You could also think of anterior cingulate circuitry as a sort of traffic cop saying, reading circuitry stop, and color naming circuitry come forward. When an error occurs, when we accidentally read a word, our internal traffic cop becomes even more driven to regulate our mental traffic correctly according to the plan to name the ink color. But this takes energy, and our internal mental traffic cop can get tired. This is why if we want strong willpower, it's important to eat a healthy breakfast. Now, it turns out that the anterior cingulate is full of circuitry involved in error detection because it functions to keep us on task. The old-fashioned word for such circuitry is cybernetic. A cybernetic process involves the pursuit of a goal and an error signal which tells us if we have deviated too far and must correct. A basic example of this is a thermostat. If we set the thermostat to our desired room temperature, that, that will be its goal. If the room gets colder than some tolerance, an error signal will be detected and it will turn the heating unit on. But after a while, if the room becomes too warm, then it will again detect an error signal and turn the heater off. Another example of a cybernetic process would be a heat-seeking missile. If its trajectory deviates from a path that will take it to its goal, the error will be corrected so that the missile can hit its target. I would like to argue that various sub-circuits in the anterior cingulate are cybernetic in that they detect errors that are then used to get back on task in pursuit of some goal. There are different error signals associated with different neural circuits in the cingulate. Some of these error signals we consciously experience as a feeling, for example, the feeling of having made an error of some type. We've just considered the dorsal anterior cingulate, which ramps up in activity when one makes a cognitive error as occurs in the Stroop task. Let's now consider a different type of error signal, this time in the ventral anterior cingulate. Interestingly, the cybernetic neural circuitry way down here in Broadman area 25, also known as the subgenual anterior cingulate because it's below the genu or bend of the corpus callosum, is neural circuitry involved in governing social emotional interactions. An error signal here is associated with the feelings of guilt or shame. In a healthy brain, this type of error signal induces us to correct our social mistakes. Interestingly, people who suffer from severe depression tend to have an overactive area 25. Now, we all make social errors now and then. Let's say you go to someone's house and you bring a salad with bacon bits on it. Then they say, I thought you knew that we were vegetarian. Oh, now this is a mistake for sure. People without depression will typically apologize, feel bad for a minute or two, and then get over it. But people with depression might dwell on an error like this for hours or days or even weeks. Whereas people without depression can turn the guilt switch off, it's as if people with severe depression have a sticky switch that cannot be reset. So they ruminate about such gaffes and slights endlessly in a kind of mental hell of self-disgust. Not coincidentally, I think, many of the same drugs that are used to treat obsessive compulsive disorders are also used to treat depression, in part, I think, because they both seem to involve something like a sticky switch. Depressed people can become so consumed with the consciously felt error signals of guilt and shame and self-loathing that they choose to commit suicide to put an end to this kind of emotional pain. Recently, my neuroscientist colleagues, Helen Mayberg and Paul Holzheimer, put a deep brain stimulating device in Area 25, deactivating its hyperactivity. In some patients with severe depression, this appears to have helped alleviate their mental torment. Looking more broadly, we can now see that we have different types of processing going on in these volitional circuits. Here again, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, we have working memory, planning, and mental operations. Here in the posterior parietal lobe, we have the dorsal stream and an analysis of salient operands, some of which get fed into the frontal lobe for planning and other mental operations. In addition, we have the ventral stream inputs, especially from among attended stimuli, that are fed into working memory and planning areas of the frontal lobe. The lateral and anterior portions of the frontal lobe select a goal or plan, but this must then be executed. 
Once a goal has been established, this medial circuitry plays a role in cybernetically keeping us on task and helping us detect errors so that we can complete tasks that we have decided to carry out. But sometimes these neural circuits fail to operate correctly, as in depression or OCD. In the next section, we'll look specifically at top-down attention and its possible neural realizations.